Hello, welcome to another Maine Historical Society virtual program. I'm Kathleen Newman. It is April 26th, 2022, and this is American Republics with Alan Taylor. Born in Portland, Maine, Alan Taylor is the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation Professor of History at the University of Virginia. A Colby College graduate, he earned his PhD from Brandeis University, and in 2020, he was elected to the American Philosophical Society. He's authored numerous books, including Liberty Men and Great Proprietors, The Revolutionary Settlement on the Main Frontier, 1760 to 1820, American Colonies, The Settlement of North America to 1800, William Cooper's Town, Power and Persuasion on the Frontier of the Early American Republic, which won the Bancroft Prize, uh, Beverage Award, uh, beverage award and uh the pulitzer and um the internal enemy slavery and war in virginia 1772 to 1832 and thomas jefferson's education um, and the topic of his uh latest book uh american republics is the subject of our talk this evening so some of you are probably already aware that maine historical society is marking 200 years as an organization this year in 2022, and that we've uh, that we recently mounted ex an exhibit uh, looking at called Northern Threads, which takes a, an up close look at some of the clothing um, from MHS's collections. And right now, if you visit the exhibit, you'll see from the period 1780 to about 1880. So the talk tonight although it's not really officially part of our At 200 series or the Northern Thread series, um, one of the reasons we wanted to have Dr. Taylor back was to this, his latest book and this time period, it would give a lot of great background to what was happening in the United, in the United States when MHS was becoming an institution and um, a lot of interesting background on you know, the pe what kind of what were the lives like of the people who were wearing and making the clothing that you see on display in the exhibit now? What was the world like that they were living in? So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Taylor, for being with us this evening. Well, thank you, Kathleen, for that very kind introduction and for, the, for my opportunity to talk tonight. So I'm going to talk about my new book. It came out just about a year ago, and it's called American Republics, and it and it covers the history of North America, which is a pretty big stage. Uh, so I, I was looking at the index, and, and Maine only appears in about six pages, but that's more than a lot of states. Uh, so it's about Canada, it's about the United States, and it's about Mexico, but very much the United States is at the center of the story as the largest of those countries and the one with the most dynamism and the one that the others had to respond to. I came to conclude in doing this book that the United States before the Civil War was a very different country. It, it wasn't as cohesive a nation. And especially at the very start of the story I'm telling, which is back in the 1780s, there wasn't a strong unifying sense of an American nationality. And on the contrary, people primarily thought of themselves in terms of their allegiance and identity with the state. And there was very bad feeling between many of these states. Now, the, the painting that I'm showing you here in this first image is by Richard Capon Woodville. And it's done in the early 1850s and it, and it appears on the cover of the book. And, and I chose this because it's very revealing about the themes of the book. It's called War News from Mexico. And you see a very excited man he is standing on the porch of a hotel. It's called the American Hotel. So it's meant to be symbolic. While a group of citizens, who at that time would all be male, are very uh, eagerly listening. While on the margins, you, there are a couple of women. Uh, there is a young African-American girl and an African-American man. Now it's rather unusual for painters of this time to include African-Americans, so it's quite a conscious choice. And the suggestion here is that the news from this war in Mexico, a war of conquest in which the United States would acquire the Southwest and California, 
uh, sweeping the country all the way to the Pacific, that this uh, would have consequences for race relations within America. And just note that the man on the left in black uh, with the plaid pants, he's holding a cigarette in his hands and he's about to drop it. And it's as if he's, he's dropping it into a barrel and it's as if it's a barrel of gunpowder. So the suggestion is that the United States is very unstable and that the conquest from Mexico could trigger an explosion that would disrupt the American Union. And so now I want to go back to the start of my story, which is the very end of the American Revolution, in which the United States was essentially in secure control of the Atlantic seaboard. Uh, and then it got a generous peace treaty from Britain that extended its boundaries west to the Mississippi. And it's a country where the, the war had been a very difficult one. And it had brought out a lot of the strains between these new states who'd never had any union before the war. They're, they're thrown together by the need to fight Britain. And there's a lot of um, acrimony within the Congress. There was no president at that time. This is before the federal constitution of 1787. There's no president. Uh, there's an executive committee and there's essentially Congress, which are delegates from states. They can't pass laws, they can only pass resolutions. And they're supposed to coordinate this war effort among the 13 member states. But there was, there's a lot of dispute between the states over whether any given state is doing its fair share. In 1777, a disgusted congressman assured a friend in Virginia quote, rely on it, our Confederacy is not founded on brotherly love. In 1788, a Massachusetts man noted, quote, instead of feeling as a nation, a state is our country. We look with indifference, often with hatred, fear, and aversion to the other states, end quote. So New Englanders didn't much like New Yorkers, Carolinians didn't like Virginians, uh, Pennsylvanians had their doubts about Connecticut people. And it's the necessity to cooperate in this very difficult war against the superpower that was Great Britain that is pushing them together. So this then is the paradox of the origins of the United States. It begins not out of common bonds, but out of mutual distrust. Or I should say it's out of a combination of the two. There's just enough bonds that they think that they could cooperate, but they think they better be members of a common club to keep an eye on each other in order to avoid the kinds of wars over the balance of power that had disrupted Europe so many times. Only by forming a union could they define the boundaries of their states, preserve authority within those boundaries. So it's because they lack a common sense of nationality that Americans needed a union. And they tended to speak of their new country as a union rather than as a nation, because nation was a controversial term because it suggested centralizing power which they weren't prepared to do. Now, Alexander Hamilton, who you're seeing here, is, says that without a union of the states, those states would remain, quote, little, jealous, clashing, tumultuous commonwealths, the wretched nurseries of unceasing discord. And in 1787, Benjamin Franklin agreed with Hamilton. He said, quote, our states are on the point of a separation, only to meet hereafter for the purpose of cutting one another's throats. So the, the, the original form of the union was framed by something called the Articles of Confederation. It had been very weak, still no president, and it was failing. It wasn't able to tax the American people. Uh, it was bankrupt, deeply in debt because of the war. Uh, and people felt we've got to come up with some alternative, some stronger union, or we're going to end up fighting one another uh, just the way the Europeans do. But here's 
the problem. On the one hand, they want a union, they need a union, but they worry that if power gets centralized in a union, that it will lead to tyranny. After all, they had just waged a revolution against Britain over Britain's efforts to centralize power in the empire. So they don't want to do that. So it's while the pressures of the war uh, and fear of one another is pushing them together, a dread of central power keeps pulling them apart. And there are three internal fault lines that they worry about. One is the familiar one, North versus South. South was uh, committed to slavery in the Northern states. Uh, slavery was legal in most of them, but it was in the process of being gradually eliminated. Uh, so there was a, a fear that maybe these were incompatible regions. But not just north-south split, but also east-west, because the western settlements on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains seem to have very different economic interests from the people living to the east of the mountains in the 13 original states. So there are very real fears that the west would hive off, form a separate country, and engage in war against the eastern states. And then finally, there are concerns on the part of the small states who feared that they would be swallowed up by the bigger states. So states like Rhode Island or Delaware are very fearful, of Massachusetts or Pennsylvania or Virginia, the bigger states. So there's a lot that Americans are fearful of. And then you could add to that, they live in a dangerous world as they perceived it. They still have powerful neighbors. They have the Spanish empire to the south and west in Florida and in what is now Louisiana. They have the British empire is still present in the Canadian provinces. And there were worries that these imperial powers run by monarchies would be hostile to the American Republican form of government and would try to exploit these internal divisions in order to blow up this very weak American Union and exercise some form of domination, perhaps restored colonial status. And so they're fearful not just of the British, but they're also fearful of the Spanish and they're even fearful of their recent allies, the French. This man, John Jay of New York, warned that without an American Union, quote, every state would be a little nation, jealous of its neighbors and anxious to strengthen itself by foreign alliances against his former friends, end quote. He feared that the Union would split, quote, into three or four confederacies, independent and probably discordant, one inclining to Britain, another to France, and a third to Spain, and played off against each other by the three empires in perpetual wars." Unquote. So this is the worst of all the fears, is that foreign powers will exploit weaknesses within the Union to pry it apart and blow it up. And it's then this combination of fears that will lead them to send delegates to Philadelphia in the summer of 1787 to try to frame a stronger union, something that would still fall short of a consolidated nation, but that would have a president, that would have the capacity to tax, that would be able to sustain an army and a navy, that would have a monopoly over diplomacy in Indian relations. It's that kind of union that they set out to create. But it's not easy. First, the big state, small state divide is something that they have to overcome. And it requires, of course, the famous compromise, which will award equality for every state in the Senate, while giving greater power in the House of Representatives to the larger states. 
And this is, you know, something that James Madison has to go along with. He's considered the father of the Constitution, but in point of fact, he didn't like the proposition to have a Senate of equal power for every state. And the other big set of compromises involved slavery because the Southern states were not gonna enter into this constitution unless they had assurances that their political power would be preserved into the future. And there are three critical compromises that are made. First is that the slave trade is protected from any interference by Congress for 20 years. And so the ban on the importation of slaves from Africa cannot go into effect until 1808 at its earliest. Second, there's the three-fifths clause. So that <clears throat> three-fifths of all the enslaved people in a given state will count toward allocating congressional seats and therefore the electoral college as well. It doesn't mean that those African-Americans get to vote. It just means that the states that have a lot of enslaved people will get a little bonus and political power. And then the third feature is that the states must all commit to return runaway slaves to their masters. So a slave that runs away from Virginia, makes it to Pennsylvania, does not become free. Might pass as free for a while, but is at risk at all times of being apprehended and sent back into slavery. And this is a guarantee in the US Constitution until it's later amended. So these three guarantees were essential to the ratification of the Constitution. This man, Stephen Hopkins, who is a minister from Rhode Island, he's initially very troubled by these three compromises. How, quote, how does it appear in the sight of heaven that these states who have been fighting for liberty cannot agree in any political constitution unless it indulge and authorize them to enslave their fellow men, end quote. But he thought about it and he said, well, we probably have to do this because it's the only way to avert, quote, a state of anarchy and probably of civil war. So the constitution is meant to fend off a civil war and it, it will do so uh, for approximately 70 years, but the day of reckoning will come. So during the early 19th century, in the wake of this constitution, there is a union, but again, it's still not a nation quite yet. And indeed they speak of the union as if it's allowing them to remain fundamentally citizens of their individual states. But there's a conviction that the free government of a republic where the people are sovereign, they think really in terms of the republic, each state is a republic. And this is a union of those state republics. But that without this union, there will be civil wars. And if there are civil wars, this will bring to power in the states military dictators so that the free form of government is understood to depend on preserving the union of the states. This is the Hopkins quote. And one of the most eloquent uh, at expressing this is Andrew Jackson, who was president during the late 1820s and into the middle of the 1830s. And he says, quote, without union, our independence and liberty would never have been achieved. Without union, they can never be maintained. But there remains uncertainty about just how strong should the federal government be? And there's a belief that the country has to expand to protect itself, to push its potential enemies farther away. So there are periodically efforts to conquer Canada 
There were successful efforts to grab Florida and eventually Texas. And later there's this war with Mexico and nearly another war with Britain over the Pacific Northwest. The great fear, however, is that one region will grab up more territory than another. So for example, if Canada is acquired, but Florida isn't, then the Northern states will become more powerful within the union. And the Southerners felt they couldn't trust remaining within the union if they don't have their own share of power. So while the union was set up to avoid wars over a balance of power, the union itself becomes a cockpit for contention over balance of power between these distrustful regions of the country. This man is from New Hampshire. He's Benjamin Brown French, and he was the clerk for the House of Representatives. He takes that job on in December of 1833. When he gets there, he's shocked by hearing what congressmen are saying to one another. They are so angry and they threaten each other so frequently with civil war. He wondered, quote, will it always be the capital of my happy country? I fear the seeds are already sown whose fruit will be disunion, but God forbid it, end quote. Yet six years later, French had heard so many more threats and seen so much literal violence between congressmen that he felt like, quote, a mourner following my country to its grave. So the union seemed especially precious because it also seemed so vulnerable during the 1820s and 30s and 40s and 1850s. Now the United States' biggest burst of expansion after the Louisiana Purchase of, of 1803 Four is the acquisition of the Southwest and California in a war of conquest against Mexico. And so it is this white zone here that's indicated on this map. And here is an addition that seems primarily will benefit the South. And Southerners were the most keen for this war and they are expecting that their way of life, including slavery, will expand westward into New Mexico and Arizona and California. But this alarms Northerners who will attempt to prevent slavery from expanding into this region. And it is over this issue that Americans will blow up their union and wage a civil war in the 1860s. And so, Richard Caton Woodville was prescient in producing this painting and suggesting that the war news from Mexico was something that was going to disrupt the union, which almost all Americans agreed was essential for protecting one another from each other, as well as from other powers. And only that protection could preserve free government. Well, the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court in 1832 was John Marshall. And at that time, he reviewed the history of the country, and he concluded, quote, the Union has been preserved thus far by miracles. I fear they cannot continue, end quote. And they wouldn't continue. There would be secession uh, starting in December of 1860 which would lead to a massive civil war that would end up killing 800,000 Americans. And that would uh, devastate about a third of the country, primarily the South. So in this civil war provoked by disunion, Americans would confront their greatest fear and the greatest fear from the very start of their nation. And they would have to rebuild that nation and turn it into a nation in order to avert the perils of secession and civil war ever again. So thank you very much. And um, with Kathleen's help, I'll be very happy to take any questions that you have.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Taylor. I wonder, I'm gonna open it up with the questions. Can you speak a little bit more to, um, to Maine's position on something like this? So maybe a little bit about how, um, like the compromise that let Maine join the union as right. a state and mm -hmm. you know what, what where is Maine in terms of these big conflicts like the um the Mexican American war and, and the civil war well Maine comes into as, as a state of course in 1820 and it's part of something called the Missouri compromise I don't know why Missouri gets all the credit um because it should, it should be the Maine compromise uh, so this is the first effort by a congressional majority to say, we don't want to add any more slave states. So it's Northerners who are pushing this, and Southerners are appalled by it. And part of the compromise is that to balance adding Missouri as a slave state, because the people of Missouri who were free wanted to come in as a slave state. To maintain a kind of balance in the Senate, they'll bring in, they'll allow Maine to come in. And Maine, of course, had been part of Massachusetts. But another element of the compromise was to draw a line across the continent, starting at the southwest corner of Missouri, and say all of the territory north of that line will be free territory and will come in as free states in the future whereas all the territory south of that line will be slave states. Now, when the line was drawn in 1820, there's relatively little territory south of the line. There's future Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, potentially if Texas gets added, but at that time, Texas wasn't part of the United States yet. Mm. So what the, what the Mexican war does is it says it adds a whole bunch of territory that's south of that line, which is why Southerners are so keen on this and why Northerners are going, oh, well, we don't think this is such a good idea. There weren't a lot of Maine men who fought in the, in the Mexican war. Uh, there were some. Uh, of course, there are thousands upon thousands of Maine men who will fight in the Civil War. And they are fighting uh, in order to restore the Union because they believed, as Lincoln had so eloquently expressed it, that free government in the world depends upon our preserving free government. And for us to preserve free government, we must preserve the Union of the States. Thank you. Uh, someone in the audience is asking, Kind of a, a question about like the the economics of this issue so how much of the conflicts that you're talking about between the different states were really conflicts that come from or impact the wealthy and maybe not so much like the average citizen well i would say they affect all citizens whether they're wealthy or not now of course the, the wealthy own more capital uh, and are in a much stronger position to benefit from the economy than people without a lot of capital. Uh, but let's just think about slavery, for example. Uh, most Southern whites did not own slaves. They just didn't have enough money to own slaves. Uh, it's you know, something on the order of about 20% of white Southern men who own slaves. But if you're, you don't currently have the means to own slaves you hope someday you will right and you want to leave that door open also there was there developed a fear of black americans mm -hmm. and the fear was if we don't keep them under control that slavery allows if they're free they will come and attack me and I may not be a slaveholder, I'm just a small farmer here, but I don't trust black people. So I want to keep blacks and slaves. So there's, a, there's a racial element to this. There's a very powerful racial element. Right. In this, mm -hmm. Okay. So slavery is an economic system, absolutely. It's also a social system. Mm -hmm. And people are defending it, whether they have a big stake in it economically or not mm -hmm. in the Southern states. Yeah, right, right. 
Uh, someone else is asking, can you speak to the roles of Clay Webster and Calhoun uh, in keeping the country together prior to civil war? Well, they're usually pulling at cross purposes, these three men. Uh, mm -hmm. Now in the, in, 1820 and 1850. Well, Calhoun's really not an enthusiast for the 1850 compromise. Mm -hmm. um, he he kind of grudgingly goes along with the 1821. Calhoun becomes a real Southern nationalist. He becomes, he, he notes that the Northern states are growing in population a lot faster because most immigrants are going to the North because there's, there's more work for them there. So the North is growing much faster. So the, by the time you get to the Civil War, there is twice as many free white people in the North as there are in the South. That means more seats in Congress. It means more electoral college votes. That's what got Lincoln elected president in 1860. Mm -hmm. So Southerners like Calhoun are saying, now, wait a minute, we've got to rejigger this constitution to protect minority regions. He wanted the South to have veto power over anything the federal government right. did. Clay, however, is from a border state. He's from Kentucky. And Kentucky is, um, Clay is more of a believer in keep leaving the Constitution alone. Mm -hmm. And Webster is very much a believer in that. But Webster has become a very strong nationalist. He's one of the first people in America who lays it out and says, we need to be a nation. We need to stop this regionalism. We need to be one people. And we need to more centralize more power in Washington, DC. Someone uh, else has an interesting question. Um, they say, it sounds as if Dr. Taylor is proposing there's a strong tendency toward disunion in the United States. Do you think that explains our current state of political affairs? Well, what I will say is that before the Civil War, disunion is something that people think about all the time. Mm. And they worry about it all the time. That's, that's what John Marshall would say. Mm. Henry Clay worries about it. Webster worries about it. Calhoun says the only way to fend this off is to give South a lot more power. Okay, so everybody's thinking about it as a possibility, and they don't really want it to happen. Not even Calhoun wants it to happen. Then the Civil War happens, and it's a nightmare. I mean, it, the, the loss of life and the destruction wrought by the Civil War, I don't think that we fully grasp. We don't remember it adequately. Mm -hmm. So when I hear people, and there are people these days, the chairman of the Republican Party in Texas, right after the last election, presidential election, uh, was frustrated uh, and said, you know, we, we ought to think about secession. And there's a New Hampshire state legislator who proposed that the constitution of New Hampshire be amended to allow New Hampshire to secede from the union. Um, I'll be blunt, that's just plain stupid. Uh, and it's a forgetting about history. People in different states today may not much like each other, red states, blue states, but we got to hang together because if right. we don't, it's, it's, that's not something um, that's a know, pretty it's, serious it's, proposal. It's, yeah, you know that we've kind of forgotten just what that really costs. Yeah, I mean these people are expressing it out of frustration, sure. and so far it hasn't gotten traction. But let's right, hope right. it doesn't get traction. Right. <clears throat> um, another question: uh, Did the Aristic War war in quotation marks? play a role in feeding opinions among New England leadership regarding the move on Mexico? Well, I wouldn't say that, but, but the, the so-called Aroostook War is significant. But what I find its chief significance is, you know, Maine people are pretty excited about this because they think that New Brunswick is grabbing lands that belong to Maine. And um, so there's, there's a mobilization of the militia and the state legislature and the governor are all excited about this. But the federal government is kind of going, let's, let's just cool this. We, we right. don't really want, you know, if you're fighting New Brunswick, you're really fighting the British Empire. And the British Empire is the most powerful Navy in the world. And U.S. does more trade with Britain than any other country. Uh, there's more investment from Britain than any other source of foreign investment into the United States. And Webster is the Secretary of State at that time. 
And Webster is working out an understanding which involves a little sleight of hand that probably does cost Maine some land over mm -hmm. what it probably should have. But Webster is willing to do that because a war with the British Empire would be so bad for business yeah. and be yeah. bad for people too. So um, the Aroostook War is a case in which the interest of a particular state, Maine, is sacrificed and the rest of the country is mostly just fine with that. Yeah. How about um, something kind of a related question? What about the role of, of Shays Rebellion, similar farmers revolts, maybe like the Whiskey Rebellion, in moving states towards agreeing to a constitution? And a follow-up question, do you see those conflicts as a rural urban divide or like a class divide between agricultural merchant class? What do you think? Well, Chase's Rebellion, and it's it's principally in Massachusetts, but there are, there are troubles in New Hampshire and some troubles in Connecticut, too, of, of farmers being upset because mm -hmm. um, they're being heavily taxed and the economy is really bad and they have debts and uh, the state legislatures in these different states have been favoring the interests of creditors who were mostly merchants. So there's certainly a, a, a class element to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is the element of people who live in these rural counties feel like the people who live in the more cosmopolitan counties like around Boston don't empathize with them, don't understand their plight. Right. Uh, so, so there's a certain element in which our current situation is also sure. replicating mm -hmm. in some ways, you know, tensions that existed mm -hmm. in the past. And people who are in the leadership of various states, including George Washington and, and Virginia and Henry Knox in Massachusetts say, we need a stronger national government in order to keep a lid on this kind of discontent. And if a state is disrupted by an internal rebellion, they can draw upon the other states through the union for protection. And so that is a very important element. And then the test is with the Whiskey Rebellion in Western Pennsylvania mm -hmm. in the middle of the 1790s, where George Washington mobilizes troops right. and goes and suppresses it and shows this is the potential of this new, somewhat stronger union. Can you speak at all to uh, Hannibal Hamlin's role in the um, time leading up to the Civil War? <laughs> Well, I, I confess that Hannibal Hamlin does not appear in this book, oh. uh, which stops in 1850. But I can say a little bit about Hannibal Hamlin because I'm working on a sequel to the book, which will be about the Civil War era. Nice. So, so Hamlin is, uh, he, the Republican Party is formed in the 1850s. And at the time it's formed, it's very much formed in the Northern states, not elsewhere by people who feel that the South has been dominating the country, despite the fact that the South had become, in terms of population, a minority of the population. So uh, somebody like Hamlin is very committed, as was Lincoln, to the proposition that the Constitution does not allow the federal government to interfere with slavery in the existing states. but it does give the federal government power over the territories. Those are those areas, mostly in the West, which have not yet become states. So the Republican Party is committed to that one proposition. They, they said early and often, we're not abolitionists. We're not going to interfere in the South. You can keep your system. We don't like your system, but it's up to you whether you want to keep it or not. What you can't do, however, is expanded into the West because we want to reserve that for common people to as small farmers to have access to that land, not open it up to plantations with slaves. So when, when Lincoln who was from Illinois is uh, chosen as the Republican party's nominee in 1860, he feels he needs uh, a New Englander to balance his ticket uh, and he needs somebody uh, who it had previously been associated with the Democratic Party, but had become a Republican. And Hamlin is his guy. Mm -hmm. And he hadn't met Hamlin before. You know, he, he, he meets him essentially at this convention 
uh, and and they are then running mates, and Hamlin will become the vice president of the United States. Did the um, did the establishment of the Northeast boundary in the 1840s lend to a stronger feeling of national identity? I'm not sure that that per se does so. What what I think does more so is uh, the War of 1812, uh, which is actually a war that on balance doesn't go very well for the United States. Mm. But Americans are pretty good at selecting out episodes which did go well, certain battles, and they emphasize those. And there are certain naval heroes and some army heroes. And there's a lot more display of the American flag around the country after that. Uh, so so I, I do think that nationalism as a belief is growing after 1812, and it grows most strongly in the northern states, whereas the southern states are, are skeptical of this nationalism it is something that's going to come back to bite them. <clears throat> and is that because of a, do you think, like a tendency towards a preference for self-government or states' rights, or is it some other kind of cultural? Yeah, they want to keep the union relatively weak as they see it, mm. where the states retain sovereignty because they don't trust a centralized, centralized national government. government. Mm -hmm. They think no matter what these Republicans may be saying, that they really are going to do things like tax slaves or make it criminal to move states across move slaves across state lines and so they they just want to be be safe they want a, a government that's powerful enough to do things like defeat mexico in war mm -hmm. but but not powerful enough to interfere with slavery within their states sure so you teased a moment ago that you're working on a a sequel tell us a little bit about the next book and when we can expect to see it well, it's going to take me a little while. Uh, it's going to be called American Civil Wars. Uh, there is a civil war in Mexico at the same time as the U.S. Civil War, and those two civil wars become interacting. Uh, and then there is in Canada, this is the time when the, uh, the Confederation of Canada takes place. So there had been these separate colonies, so New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland, the two Canadas, Lower Canada, Upper Canada, uh, and, and British Columbia, uh, they were all distinct. Uh, and they're linked to the British Empire. But the British Empire really wants to remove itself from North America because it's just a source of conflict with the United States, mm. potential conflict. So, so British leaders are actually encouraging Canadians to pull this together. And, and Canadians are a little reluctant, but what persuades them is a they, they're looking across the border and they see what civil war looks like. And they've got their own division between Francophones and Anglophones that they worry that could blow up into a civil war and we don't want to do what those crazy Americans have just done. Excellent. Well, thank you again so much uh, for being here and for, uh, for sharing your, your time and your expertise with us this evening. Um, the book is called American Republics. And um, you can find lots of the other books I mentioned um, by Dr. Taylor available in the Maine Historical Society Museum Store. So visit mainhistorystore.com. And uh, if you haven't had a chance yet to visit our exhibits, Northern Threads, or MHS in Pictures, uh, if you haven't been to our campus in a while, we would love to see you back. And uh, you can learn more about how to visit and even buy tickets, or if you prefer to see these exhibits from home, you can visit virtually at mainhistory.org. So thank you again, everybody, for being with us tonight. And um, thank you, Dr. Taylor. Thank you very much.